Hey, and welcome to Capturing Christianity. I've got a really exciting show for you today. We're talking about near-death experiences. I'm talking with a cardiologist. His name is Dr. Michael Sebaum. Did I pronounce that correctly? Sebaum? Close enough. Close enough. Uh, well, he is a he's a cardiologist. He's a confessing Christian, and he's a near-death experience researcher. He also appeared in the film After Death which just premiered, uh, I think, on October 27th. Today is November 2nd, so it's still in theaters. So if you guys are interested in go, uh, going and watching that, and uh, Dr. Sebaum is in the actual film himself. He's one of the interviewees. And he's also written a few books, on the, or a couple books on the subject, Recollections of Death, A Medical Investigation, and Light and Death, One Doctor's Fascinating, uh, fascinating Account of Near-Death Experiences. So that's what we're talking about today on the channel, Near-Death Experiences. The first thing that I'd like to to ask you, Dr. Sabom, is what is your background uh, as a cardiologist, and then how did that lead you into starting to research into the area of near-death experiences? Well, my background is mainly medical. Uh, went to medical school in Galveston, Texas, and then did some training in the University, in Flo University of Florida prior to being drafted into the Army for a couple of years, came back. And I was doing my cardiology residency at the University of Florida and uh, a psychiatric social worker in the hospital that I was working with showed me a book in uh, 1975. It was Raymond Moody's first book, Life After Life. And uh, I'll be quite honest with you, I thought it was hogwash. Uh, I had never heard of these experiences before. I actually even went into the hospital and asked other older physicians whether they had heard of them and they had not. So I was quite skeptical of the whole thing. Uh, and Sarah, who is the psychiatric social worker, was presenting a, a presentation on Moody's book to a Methodist Sunday school class and asked me to go ask a few of my patients whether they had had this experience and I was very reluctant to do that, but she twisted my arm long enough. So I finally gave up and did it. And the third patient I interviewed had a classic near death experience as Moody had described in his book. Now Moody's book, he admits this in writing in the book. It was not a scientific study. He had, he had interviewed approximately 50 people and uh, they had given him these stories that he, he coined the term near-death experience and had, I think he had 12 or some uh, features in the, the stories that then became what's known as the classic near-death experience. Anyway, the, the presentation by Sarah went well. Afterwards, we got together. We, we thought that maybe we ought to look into this further. Uh, she convinced me to do that. And so we set about... Uh, making a scientific study protocol in which we inter interviewed patients, tape recorded the interviews, collected a lot of background data, and of course, uh, got details, medical records or whatever, to document the experience itself. As a cardiologist, I was interested in seeing whether or not these were really uh, actual experiences. And the way I did that was to pay particular attention to what I termed at the time, the autoscopic, which is a word meaning self-visualization, part of the experience. That's the typical out-of-body experience where they, were, they float up out of their body when they're unconscious and near death, and uh, they see details. They see things that are going on. And as a cardiologist, I said, well, this is an easy thing to find out one way or the other, whether the details you're see seeing are actually real and accurate. And very surprisingly, the people that I talked to were very honest about it. And they, a, a few of them could uh, come up with details that were very accurate, very unique to the situation that had happened. And they were out of the physical view of the patient as they, they were lying there unconscious being resuscitated. So I then looked into possible explanations of how this could happen. How could somebody see something 
from out of an out of body location. And then later you could go back and show that what they had seen actually had occurred. I put all of this in the book along with the data and, and published it in 1982, I believe. Uh, but this is the thing, this is a part of the experience that really hooked me on continuing the investigation. There was something going on here that could not be explained by normal scientific process. And I was determined to find out perhaps what, what that might indicate or be. So that's how I got into the uh, whole thing of near-death experiences. There's about a thousand questions rolling around in my brain right now that I'd like to to ask you about. I'm trying to to narrow in on, on just one. Um, as you were talking about these experiences that you've had, you you've done this research personally. You've interviewed people personally. How many would you say of these folks that have had a near death experience? How many of them recall accurate data on these on these uh, what was the term autoscopic? autoscopic. These autoscopic these autoscopic experiences, how many of them reported accurate information and how many reported, you know, inaccurate information that they were, it just didn't make any sense. It didn't line up with yeah. what was actually happening in the room. Great question. Uh, of the 116, uh, there were 32 who had an autoscopic portion of their near death experience of the 32, only six has specific, specific details where I could go back and find and show and verify the accuracy of. The other majority of these autoscopic experiences were quite vague, quite general, like, and they, weren't, they were not incorrect, but they didn't have any details that would be unique to verify that, that, that they had actually seen it from out of their body. For instance, a, a patient would say something like, well, I saw the doctor do, uh, and the doc nurse come in and they were standing around my bed and that, that sort of general thing that could, could be. Anybody could uh, say that. They were non-specific. Uh, what I was looking for is are specific details, things that were unique to the situation that I knew had happened and I could document and, and were out of view, a physical view. Uh, of the patient as they were lying there in bed. So it's important to point out also that with a cardiac arrest, and most of these patients were cardiac arrest patients, with a bona fide cardiac arrest, you lose conscious, it's been shown in multiple studies that consciousness is lost and the EEG is flat within 15 to 20 seconds after the onset of the flat line arrhythmia. And so what we're dealing here with uh, in, in a hospital, there's no way you can resuscitate a patient within 15 seconds of the start of the arrhythmia, uh, unless you're standing right there, which most of the, all these patients were either in a room somewhere in the ICU, but just the same, just to get the equipment over there, hooked up, ready to go. 15 seconds is not possible. So they were unconscious according to this uh, period of time. They were, it was during a period of time when they were unconscious and obviously near death. So some people in the comments are asking, is this the guy that was in the movie After Death? Yes, this is Dr. Sabom from the movie After Death, which just released in theaters on October 27th. It is currently in theaters if you're watching this live or if you're watching it a couple weeks after it premiered. Uh, otherwise, you may be able to pick it up over at Angel Studios or wherever else they've they've got it available for you. But the, uh, the movie is called After Death. So uh, the, the next question that I've got for you is what is like in your research and just, you know, going far beyond like what you've personally investigated, what are some of the most compelling cases of NDEs from your research that have basically convinced you that the afterlife is real, if that is a conclusion that you've reached? In my second study, and I'm not saying this just with my, uh, experience, but this happened uh, in my second study and is, con and is considered, widely considered, the most well-documented case and unexplainable case on record. And that's the case of Pam Reynolds, who was a 35-year-old woman 
in Atlanta at the time. She had a giant basilar artery aneurysm in her head. That's up there in the head. And the neurosurgeons in Atlanta uh, refused to operate on her because the location of the aneurysm was in such a deep and delicate position. She flew out to Phoenix, Arizona to a, a neurosurgeon who had developed a special type of procedure called hypothermic cardiac arrest. That's where you lower the body temperature down to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the EEG is flat. Uh, the uh, Obviously, the heart is stopped. Everything was at standstill. And that's, a matter of fact, what they call it, nicknamed standstill. When the Time when all those conditions were met, everything was at standstill. Uh, they tilted the top of the operating room table up and put, she had been placed on a, a cardiopulmonary bypass machine and they drained the blood out of her head so that the aneurysm could collapse and then the surgeon could go in there and safely take it out. Uh, during this procedure, uh, Pam had an out-of-body experience, the autoscopic part, where she was able to see and describe uniquely the bone saw. She said it looked like an electric toothbrush. And in the book, Light and Death, I have these pictures in there so you can see for yourself uh, what I'm talking about. She described that. She described the equipment off to the side of the operating room table. And very importantly, she heard a conversation between Dr. Spessler, who was the neurosurgeon, and a cardiovascular surgeon who was operating on her femoral artery in her groin to, uh, to cannulate it so that they could remove the blood from her body. And that conversation she remembered very accurately at a time that her eyes were taped shut she was deeply unconscious, her EEG was flat, and she had these uh, earbuds in both ears, and they were emitting uh, 95 decibel clicks several times a second. There was absolutely no way she could have physically heard this conversation, but she did. And she repeated what they said uh, at that time. Uh, now, the reason for these earbuds in the ear was to check the brainstem activity at the time uh, because if there was no uh, blip on the monitoring device of the brainstem at the time the sound was made, made, that meant the brainstem was flatlined also. So she was as close as you can get to death under experimental conditions uh, that you could be. And she had this experience uh, and then the next day after she was coming out of anesthesia, she started telling the assistant neurosurgeon, Carl Green, uh, about this. And that, this is actually in the uh, After Death movie. Carl Green was interviewed. And Pam was telling him about the conversation and about what was going on at the time. So there was no time lapse between waking up, talking to other people, them relaying on to her uh, what had happened, and then she concocted, concocted it up as her own story, which is, by the way, often uh, an excuse uh, or an explanation for how these experiences occur and are accurate, it, obtaining the information from other people later. In Pam's case, that hmm. wasn't true. So. This case has been examined and criticized for multiple inter internationally. I mean, th this is a very well-known case. And it, like I say, is the number one case uh, showing that there is actually something there that cannot be explained uh, with normal scientific methods. Well, well, how do skeptics usually respond to cases like these? Uh, well, okay, well, Susan Blackmore, there, there are two skeptics that have gone, really taken this to heart. 
Susan Blackmore is a psychologist over in England. And she says that what these experiences are, are not happening at the time that they're, the patient is fully unconscious, but they're an emergent uh, reaction to going in and coming out of the anesthesia itself. And this is where Pam's case blows that hypothesis apart because her, her uh, observations, her experience mm -hmm. occurred in the middle of the surgery. The surgery was six hours. I think it was like three hours into the operation, she heard these things and saw these things happen. So she wasn't coming in and out of anesthesia. That explanation just went out the window. Now, Dr. Gerald Worley, who's a German anesthesiologist, he's written a book about this, these experiences. And he explains, hold on to your seat. He explains that Pam heard this conversation, uh, the, the sound waves that were created when Spessler was talking to the cardiovascular surgeon were transmitted through the operating room table, through the uh, three-pronged uh, metal device that was holding her head still, through her brain, and then she heard that conversation like that, like you and I talking and the, the vibrations from our sound waves from our mouth during the conversation created all of that. He, he, he hmm. came up with it. This has never been proven by anybody. To me, I think it's absolutely absurd, but he came up with it as the only possible way to explain how Pam could have heard this without hearing it from out of her body the way she said she did. Um, so th that's where we, we're, we've gotten to with the Pam Reynolds case, and it remains uh, the best case that we have so far uh, of, of this sort of situation. I've also heard a story, I can't remember the details. Uh, this is not an area that I've personally done much research into, but there, there was one case, I, maybe you know of it, there was this, uh, I, I can't remember even if it was a, a man or a woman, but they noticed a uh, some writing on some medical equipment on like top of a shelf. And uh, they, they <clears throat> from their perspective, they couldn't even, you know, get up there and, and see that. Are, are you familiar with any cases like that? Uh, vaguely. Okay. And this brings up another important point. One of the most important aspects of this research is documentation third party documentation, medical records, eyewitness reports, etc. And if you don't have documentations and you say you heard this from a nurse who said this because the patient said it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's not documentation. Uh, and, and I'm very critical about this because as a physician, if it's what they say about medical records, if it's not written down in the medical record, it didn't happen. That's, that's how important the record is to these cases. And if you can't document them or you have not documented them, then, but the, they're accepted by the public in a written book. And we've got lots of them, a lot of Christians, have had very powerful near-death experience, near near-death experiences, and sold millions of books and movies, and people buy buy them and believe them. And when they're asked, "Well, was there anybody else there? Do you have any any doctors or EMT people or medical records or anything?" No. It's trust me, it happened. And if they're a Christian authority stating such an experience happened to them and that experience the Christian authority is claiming is a trip to the afterlife, then they're, they're accepting something that has not been shown to have really happened by anything other than the word of mouth opinion of the person who had the experience. There's no documentation that it happened. So I, I'm very strict on that. 
And as a cardiologist, I must admit, I'm in a privileged position because I'm often there at the time of the cardiac arrest and I have access to the third party documentation. So I'm not blaming other people, but when they refuse to release that, then it brings up a red flag in my brain that maybe or maybe not it happened. Just like the case you just reported to me there. Uh, I wanna know who saw it, what were the circumstances, who, who verified it and et cetera. I mean, because word of mouth uh, doesn't cut it with me. Well, that does bring up an interesting question. So when it comes to, remind me the, the name of the, of the woman that we were just, just discussing. Right. Oh, Pam Reynolds. Pam Reynolds. So with respect to her case, I mean, what we have in, in her case, and maybe you can just let me know, like, do you think that this qualifies as scientific evidence that we've got from, because from, what we have in, in essence is testimony that is then backed up or sort of corroborated with other existing facts, like this conversation right. that was right. occurring between the doctor and the nurse. So, but what we have is is testimony in that case. And then we also have the testimony of the assisting uh, physician that was there that heard her story. So it, it could be the case that, you know, that the testimony from the assistant neurosurgeon is is incorrect or was, you know, he was making that up. So. Okay. So that, that then would, that's his testimony. Then we have the written medical records from the chief uh, neurosurgeon, Spetzler. We have the written medical records of the cardiovascular surgeon. Uh, we have the medical records of the, uh, the technician who is hooking her up with these things in her ears. Uh, and we, so, I mean, at some point, you're right. You're right. Uh, you could con concoct, this is a probability. I mean, the, and, and I, it then comes down to what do you consider legitimate legal evidence and if, if you if you have all these sources from different people and you see no reason why they should be lying or making up making it up at some point you have to say the evidence but is is still evidence but it's enough to make a conclusion that beyond a beyond beyond a reasonable doubt that this actually happened the way it did. But you're using the word evidence, and that is a very good word to use. It's not proof, it's evidence. And when you're relying upon personal reports and all this kind of stuff, all you can do is show evidence, 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 but all the evidence is not proof. So you can't prove an experience happened, period. You can get all the evidence collected, but it's still not proof. So an, an, another question that was really interesting, I think that you even brought it up in, in the movie. You were talking about the difference. I can't remember the term that you used, the difference between the sort of uh, autoscopic experiences that they have of their own bodies what's right. going on in that medical room. And then there's a difference between that experience and then the sort of supernatural or metaphysical thing that, that occurs after that, where they go and see some sort of tunnel of light, or they have some experience with Jesus, or uh, there was even, you know, document or uh, observations of like a, a sort of hellish experience. Right. Do you place much credence in those observations or those reports as you do in the ones that are, are are more autoscopic. Well, let me let me say this: uh, they they are very consistent a lot of times between people, between cultures, etc. But your point is well made in that you cannot document a transcendental near death experience. There's nobody there to say, "Yeah, that really happened," or "What you saw was true," or "Here's a document to show that." blah, blah, happened when you were out, it's, it's, that is all self-report. And no, I don't, I don't believe, you, you can't scientifically say that that's equivalent to where you're, 
you're documenting something with evidence of the material universe. These are all immaterial, transcendental experiences that cannot be proven one way or the other. Or the other. So you're right about that. And I, I, as a scientist and a, a cardiologist, I put less credence on those. Although they're very important, I put less credence on those. And by the way, this brings up another issue. I consider these to be near death, not after death experiences. I think that they're spiritual experiences occurring during the process of dying prior to final physical death. So when somebody says they have a transcendental experience, they went to heaven, saw this, saw that, met God, told this, and then comes back and reports it. I, I don't, that, that to me contradicts both medically and biblically, uh, the fact that they actually went to heaven, came back and reported about it. Mm -hmm. And if we, we want to have that discussion, we can have that also. But uh, I, I'm very skeptical of that. And that's that to me is not what these experiences are. Having said that, the people who have these experiences truly believe ardently that they mm -hmm. died and went to heaven. So they're very real to the person. But when you when you're not when you're observing them, evaluating them from a third person standpoint, uh, it's not to me. It, it doesn't wash. Well, I wonder if there's a connection that could be made. Maybe there are like certain people that are a little bit more credible than than others. So, like in the case of Reynolds, like she seems like a very credible witness. If what she reported accurately represented what was going on in that medical room. And so maybe the fact that there are other corroborative facts surrounding her case, at least in the, uh, the autoscopic portion, maybe that can then sort of transfer her credibility to the experience that she had in the supernatural realm or, or whatever. Do, do oh, you yeah. see there's a, do you yeah, see that connection? Yes, I sure do. And I think that's because a lot, Actually, she had a transcendental experience. She had three three elements of her experience. She had the out-of-body part, and then she had a transcendental part where she went down a tunnel, saw a light, met, met several of her deceased relatives, and then came back and saw autoscopically again when they were resuscitating her after they had stopped her heart and, and brought her back to life, so to speak, or brought her heartbeat back so it's a it, she describes it as a continuous experience to her it was all real one part was as real as the other part so you could make an argument that it's all one experience if one part of the experience was verified reality then the other part may be but that's an inference that's not proof and it, it it's evidence but it's evidence that's weaker than actually verifying what she said that she saw right right well let's move on I, i'd like to ask you about your uh, sort of religious background and, and what role you think that that plays in your interpretation of of NDEs. do you think that your religious background has influenced the way that you look at this evidence or data I, I would not say my religious background influenced what I saw or what I found. I think my religious background has influenced greatly how I interpret it. And I don't, I, and we've already talked about this a little bit. I do not interpret this as being a trip to the afterlife and back. And I take issue with that and that we've already discussed that. So that's, that's a very, that's a bit, very red line with me. Uh, as far as I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a Bible believing Christian. And so I rely on the Bible as a word of God. And I look into that to see if they're consistent with the word of God. So it's not just what I can show scientifically. It also is how does it wash with biblical teaching? 
So in that way, yes, my religion has affected. Well, have you also noticed any sort of commonalities between these experiences religiously? Are there any sort of like themes or religious, you know, uh, elements that you think are, are sort yeah, of consistent well, across the, the Indies? Yes and no. The yes part is, is considered, and I don't know if you're familiar with the term general revelation of God. Yeah. General revelation of God is, is from Romans 1 and 2. The law of God is written on the hearts of all persons or all men is what they say in the Bible. We now say person. But everybody has the law of God written on their hearts. And you can suppress it, but it's there anyway. And I know of examples, very prominent examples, of atheists who have had these experiences and have been convinced that the experience actually made them a believer in God because it is a, it's a general revelation of God, so to speak. When, and, and these people feel uh, that they have gone and had an experience that suggested to, to them that it's an afterlife and God was there uh, with them. So in that vein, yes, that's across the board. And that's in all religious backgrounds and ages and, and all the demographic backgrounds uh, across uh, in the world. So, however, having said that, it's not the special revelation, which is the revelation of Christ. It's not a Christian specific experience. It's a God experience, not a Christian experience. In other words, people are not pe people who think now that they believe in God. Now they then, if they develop a religion after that can go in any kind of direction they want. It doesn't channel them into one particular religious belief, such as Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism. They just become uh, an atheist. Or, or well, the atheist becomes a God believer. Believing well, yeah, that's what I meant. The, th the yeah, atheist right, becomes right. a theist. Oh, there yeah, I, I know. A it was worded. Atheist. <laughs> right, right. Thank you. Good point. <laughs> well, um, there was another question. There was a, a period of time where I was kind of looking into things. Uh, not I, Again, not very seriously, but there was a, this account that I read of this person uh, who said that they had a sort of near-death experience, but they didn't experience anything. And that seems also to be fairly common, is that people that, that go into the state, they just don't have any experience at all. But yeah. what what seems to me like on the hypothesis that there is an afterlife or that something does happen after death or at the moment near death or you know when the heart stops and, con and you lose consciousness, if that's the hypothesis, that hypothesis seems to predict that everyone near that state is going to have some sort of experience. So when we have cases that, that don't have those experiences, that seems to disconfirm the hypothesis. So that seems to provide some counter evidence, people that just lack experience. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, there are a lot of drugs and different things. There are a lot of different uh, aspects to the remembrance of these experiences. But when you say the person didn't did not have the experience, the correct way of putting that is the person did not remember having an experience. They may have had an experience and just didn't remember it. And there are a lot of things that happen in circumstances where during a cardiac arrest, you may be given different medicines that cloud it or whatever. But hmm. the, the bottom line is we don't have a real answer to that question. Only 10 to 15% of people who have a cardiac arrest will recall these experiences. The rest do not recall them. They may or may not have, they may or may have had them, but they could not recall them. I can't prove that, but basically that is one explanation. Uh, but I don't think that the absence of the experience in everybody disproves the fact that in some of them, they can remember having the experience. If you have one case, and this is 
This is referred to as the white crow. Uh, the white crow, all you need to do if you're going to prove that all crows are black is find white one, white, one white crow, you know, and that's, the, that's sort of, a, I don't know who did that many or said that a long time ago, but uh, you don't need to show that all crows are white. All you need to do is show that only that one of them was white. Thus, all crows are not black. That statement is false. So I, I don't know if I'm wandering here in my mind, but basically the absence of it is not proof that some people did remember them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the best way to uh, to rephrase that. And so what one thing that you could do is that the hypothesis that I was specifying was that, you know, near death experiences or the, the afterlife is real, something along those lines. And that's going to pretty much apply to everyone. If everyone is conscious and consciousness continues to exist after the body dies and everything, then that would seem to predict that everyone would have that experience. And you, what you what you responded with was that uh, it could be the case that everyone does have an experience. They just don't remember it, um, which is, I think, pretty reasonable. But what you another move that you could make is you could uh, forward a different hypothesis that says that there is at least one you know, near death experience that is veridical, something along those lines. And that then would then be supported by the evidence that there is at least, you know, this, just this one case of, of Reynolds, like she provides, I think, fairly good evidence in support of at least, you know, that some people experience, have these experiences and some of them are veridical. If that's the hypothesis, then that does seem to be supported by the evidence. Okay. Well, I, I can't argue with that. The, the thing <laughs> you, at, at, at the front of what you were just saying about the afterlife, again, everybody has, I believe, and this is biblical. We're, we're talk, This is where science meets religion, okay? And some things that science cannot explain, with, there is an answer in Scripture, okay? So if you don't believe in Scripture, then you're left, what happened? I don't know. But we're not talking about the presence or absence of an afterlife or life after death. We're talking about the presence or absence of remembering an experience that happened during the dying process prior to final physical death, after which the afterlife are come, uh, comes about. So it, it's, it's the before experience that we're talking about here. It's not the after. It, it's entirely possible that uh, if you're not a Christian and you don't, that, that the, you could have a very detailed near death experience. And then when final physical death comes, there's nothing. I can't say that doesn't happen, except that's not my Christian biblical belief. So I don't know if I'm making any sense here, but it, we're, we're not talking about afterlife here. We're talking about before life experiences because mm -hmm. you can, and this is another uh, quandary here. You can have after you can have near death like experiences. For instance, general anesthesia. A lot of times a person can have an out of body like experience and look at what's going on in the operating room, but not be near death. So it can happen in other situations too. So we don't have the final word on this, but again, I believe that it commonly does occur or seems to occur uh, in the dying process prior to final physical death. I'd like to return to one of the topics we, we spoke about briefly and you mentioned general revelation, how these experiences are usually consistent with general revelation, which which what you meant by that is that they're consistent with this sort of general concept of there being a God. And, and usually, uh, from what I understand, it's like a God of love or some, you know, this, this loving of, being at the... the yeah. yeah. Well, are, are there any specific characteristics of, uh, you know, say an experience that happened in India that had specific characteristics that were unique to the Hindu religion that would therefore be inconsistent with, say, the Christian story? Are there any accounts like that that are inconsistent with the, the Christian yeah. story? Yes. The, the, yes. 
the identity, the identity, the interpretation of the light, which some people think is God, of a Hindu and a Christian, the interpretation of that is consistent with the religious beliefs of the person who had the experience, the interpretation of it. But the presence of it is similar. It's called a core, a core near-death experience. The presence of presence of the elements are similar, but the interpretation of the elements by the person is dependent upon the background of the person involved, Hindu, Christian, Buddhist, whatever. Well, so has, uh, maybe to be more specific, has a, in, uh, a Hindu person had an experience of like Vishnu or some other like goddess or God uh, in their sort of transcendental aspect of their experience? Have, are, are there any cases like those, which would seem to contradict the, the Christian story. Are there any like specific, because like in some of the, the Christian examples, you have like people going and seeing relatives or people, you know, uh, Christ leading them from like hell to heaven, you know? And so it, it seems fairly plausible that a Hindu person might experience something like Vishnu or one of the other thousands of, of gods that they've got in their religion. It, has that occurred? If it hasn't occurred, then... Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. I mean, I'm not that familiar with the Hindu religion, but I, I'm just saying that it's a god. It's, for instance, let me just give you this one example of A.J. Ayer. He was an atheist. Uh, he was a very well-known atheist, and he had a near-death experience in the 1990s. And he went to another world, and he met, he saw and met the master of the universe. Okay. But he was an atheist and he refused to say he saw God, but he saw the master of the universe. And that was a personal choice of his own because he didn't want to alienate all of his atheist friends by saying he met God or he saw God or there is a God. So it, it's, but the master of the universe is basically a definition of God. I mean, in some, some way or, or fashion. And so the point is that again, the, the presence of a Supreme being, whatever you want to call it can be placed in all of these different religions. And most likely, I'm sure there's an exception somewhere, but most likely they're going, going to interpret that which is usually the light in view of their religious background uh, that they have. So, yeah, I mean, I was going to, going to go back to the question of uh, these sort of skeptical objections to near-death experiences, although I think we've uh, pretty much covered that. Are there, are there any other uh, very popular or common objections that skeptics will raise against, say, the, the Reynolds case or... Uh, any of these other like highly evidential cases? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I've the heard that I've heard that there are people, you know, that the the brain activity that occurs right before death and the brain activity that right that occurs right after they or uh, right, yeah, right after they come back, like that brain activity can be used to explain the the crazy vivid experiences that they, uh, you know, allegedly had. What about yeah. something along those well, lines? Well, we're we're now getting. Andrew Newberg, who's a uh, neuroradiologist, and he's done functional MRIs on people in the in meditations and stuff like that. And he makes a point, and other people have made the point that when you see some activity in the brain at the same time as they're having a near death experience, you don't know whether the activity is causation or correlation. In other words, is that brain activity correlated with, oh, let me, let me back up here. Let me use the example of a radio, okay? A radio plays music, okay? And if you go and smash the radio, it no longer plays music, but do you smash in the process of smashing the radio, do you then smash the music, the source of the music? No, that's the, the channel 
or, or the radio station that is coming from. In other words, the brain can be, it's now thought to be by most people, a, a transmission device or, or organ and not a causative organ. So the brain waves can reflect or correlate with, but they don't cause the actual music or whatever image that you're talking about. Does that make sense? Correlation uh, versus causation. Yeah, no, the the yeah, the correlation versus causation uh, distinction I think is a really helpful one, uh, especially when it comes to discussing you know, scientific like the radio evidence. Radio is is correlated with it, but it doesn't cause it. And if the radio is like your brain, it's correlated with it. The the things that are going on in the brain at the time they're having an experience, mm -hmm. but it doesn't cause the experience. It's caused by something else. Yeah, I, I think though, in, in some cases, correlation is uh, still evidence for causation. So in the case of like right. someone responding to the yeah. the you know the NDEs they could just say well there is correlated brain activity that is heightened or different right at the moment of death or right after the moment or right at the moment of you know waking up and that that weird wild brain activity that's that's occurring there while it is just correlated brain activity it could explain in principle and therefore maybe provide some evidence that it's just a natural phenomenon it could yeah but then, as you said, there there are cases where it's like the person, while their brain activity was ceasing, they were seeing things that, you know, in the room heard a conversation that they couldn't have otherwise heard or been a part of. And so yeah, like, that explanation, I think it, it fails to uh, it has a narrow explanatory scope. It doesn't explain everything. There are still yeah. gaps that it, that it can't explain. It, it may explain some if it if it explains anything it may explain some of them but it doesn't explain everything and so right. there, there is going to there's still going to be some some gaps why don't we move on to uh, as we sort of wrap up the interview why don't we move on to discuss uh, really briefly the sort of the future of nde research what do you think what areas do you think need to be explored and studied to provide a more sort of compelling account for ndes as evidence okay uh I don't want to go into a deep, dark hole, but there's there's an ongoing uh, effort by Sam Parnia at, at New York Langoon Hospital. That's where it's headed. Uh, that's where the head of the program is. And what they're doing or trying to do is put targets in these rooms where people commonly have a cardiac arrest to see if they can catch an out-of-body experience where the person floats up and sees the target and then comes back and reports the number on the target. That would be even advancing the evidence part further. You're not mm -hmm. relying upon an anecdotal case with a lot of potential confounding features to it as you've been doing, but it really indicates that this target was there, placed there, nobody else knew what was on that target and the person saw it, came back, and then they checked the target, and he was right. They have, I think there's a, that's been, those efforts have been going on now for a total of about 26 years, I think, and over 2,500 cardiac arrests have been uh, monitored in this, in this way, and they have not yet found one effort or one, one instance where the target, the, there was a hit on the target by the person from an out-of-body experience. That's very strange because when you're looking at anecdotal cases, which basically what I have been doing, uh, that uh, the incidence of the out-of-body experience is a lot higher uh, than zero. So uh, th that has yet to be explained. And the people who are involved in this, and we're getting into parapsychology now, the people who are involved in this uh, have come up with the conclusion that there's actually a spiritual component to this that's interfering with these hits. Uh, but that again, that's, that's just a hypothesis that has not been uh, proven. But uh, that, that would help 
answer some of the questions that have been brought up about a case like Pam Reynolds that uh, was not under a controlled experimental protocol. Yeah, no, I, I've I've heard uh, similar responses to that to uh, prayer studies where there's a controlled experiment experiment on whether or not prayer actually works and, and helps someone get better or heal. And uh, usually in those those studies, it's either negative or positive, but it's it's usually uh, negligible. It's it's a very you know it, it seems like prayer doesn't do a whole lot. Um, but what a lot of people have pointed out is that what you're doing is you're trying to control something that involves agency. So like God is involved in this. And uh, if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, then it, it just, I don't know uh, if you're doing no, it for the purpose of, of trying to do the study and everything. You did a very then, good job of explaining that. Okay. Yeah. Randolph Bird was the guy who did that first intercessory prayer study of people in ICUs with cardiac problems. And there was a, I forget, there was a very tiny statistical difference between those who were prayed for and those who were not prayed for. But there's so many confounding, is, confounding issues here. What, what if the other people who weren't in the study were praying for those people too and they didn't know it? Uh, exactly. You know, all, all sorts of things going on there. But what you had to say was very correct. And that, that is what uh, a lot of parapsychologists, I'm not saying you are one, uh, have brought up, and, and that is that when you're trying to control a spiritual experience with a scientific method and looking for scientifically proven results, it breaks down. And one one reason for that is that if God is involved in the spiritual part of this, he does not allow that for his reason that the scientific part will be proven. In other words, there is a verse in Bible that says uh, to, to ple you please God through faith. You don't please God through actual scientific experiments. You said and that does actually, well, it does actually seem consistent also with uh, the idea of divine hiddenness. I mean, some, some atheists use it as an argument against God's existence, but to me, it just seems like more of a, a fact of the way that God set up the universe is that he's He's made it sort of ambiguous, that you can go either direction. You've got to follow the evidence and go based on what you've got available. And it would seem like if we had a controlled you know, experiment where we were able to get this super strong evidence this one way or the other, then that would not necessarily remove the agency involved of the people that are that are trying to weigh the evidence themselves. But it does seem inconsistent with the way that God has set up the universe such that he's given us the freedom to go whatever way that, you know, our, our hearts ultimately want to go. So uh, very interesting questions are, are getting raised here, but uh, we're, we're nearing the one hour mark. So I think we're going to go ahead and, and wrap things up. Is there anything that you'd like to share either about the film or about your own personal work? Uh, I, I mentioned your two books. And uh, at, at the beginning of the interview, is there anything else you'd like to mention as we close out the interview? Uh, no, I think you've covered the difficult part of the experience. Uh, you know, th this, by the way, I, I think this would make not necessarily a good movie, but at least this kind of a discussion is, I think, very valuable. Because uh, mm -hmm. we know these experiences are happening. And they're very emotional. They're very exciting uh, and interesting. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I was surprised in the film after death how how many of these people were getting so emotional when they were relaying what they experienced. Oh, yeah. oh it's a powerful experience. Uh, but the emotion part is one thing, but the scientific part is another, and then the spiritual part is another entirely too. And I think they're different areas there that need further explanation. And I think the spiritual and the scientific part, we're just beginning to understand what's going on. Amen. Well, Dr. Sabom, thank you so much for joining me on Capturing Christianity. Really enjoyed seeing you in that film. Uh, I recommend that if you guys are interested in this subject, is I, I think it's a must-see. The visuals in it, I haven't even talked really about like my thoughts on the film. Uh, we were talking about this right before we went live, but the visuals in the film were 
phenomenal. Like I wanted to know as a photographer, I wanted to know how they actually got those. Like, was it CGI? Did they use special effects? What, what did they use? It was so pretty. <laughs> um, but yeah, the film, the film is, is, uh, I would say it's, it's definitely worth a watch if you're interested in this subject. If you have any sort of interest at all, then go give it a watch. But thank you guys for tuning in. See you in the next video. See Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?